How's it going, everybody? Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm about to play a clip from my uh, one plus hour conversation that I had with Zoltan Poser. First of all, because I'm a greedy YouTuber, obviously, but also because my um, my my DMs have sort of been full. I'm not actually full. Like a couple of people asked me if I could make these clips shorter. Um, they said that they don't have time to watch the full conversation in one sitting, and I respect them lying to me because I know that what's really happening is is that it's it's just really hard to listen to me asking dumb questions for one whole hour. And, um, they, you know, they just don't want me to speak. They don't want the guests to speak. So I agree with all that. And I'll probably do more of this moving forward. But um, the full the full interviews will still be available. And um, w with this one as well, I have a link somewhere in the, I don't know, the comments in the description or whatever uh, to the full interview. And uh, in that full interview, we talked about macro. We talked about, um, that's actually the first part, part that you'll watch today, but so we talked about macro. So then also talk to me about commodities and what he thinks uh, those would do over the next decade. And uh, spoilers, it's not bearish. I uh, I even asked him how he would start building a portfolio in this ever so challenging market, um, aka a market that sucks. But so, um, yeah, I, I'd wait for those clips to come onto YouTube in the next couple of days or um, head over to that link. It's probably, yeah, the description or whatever, somewhere. And uh, in the meanwhile, I'll shut up and play that clip. Um, let, let's say we get on a plane, 40,000 feet in the air. We look at the state of the global economy and geopolitics. What are we paying attention to and what are we seeing there? I think the things to, to pay attention to is that geopolitics is really important these days. Um, I think we've spent a couple of decades as investors focusing mostly on macroeconomic variables, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, corporate earnings. And we did that in the context of a unipolar world order um, where great power conflict uh, was not an issue. Um, and today, I think what's, what's, what's fundamentally different is that uh, you know, two great powers, the US and, and China are, uh, you know, uh, uh, one, is, one is the incumbent hegemon, the other is uh, the rising hegemon and world order uh, is being ne renegotiated um, uh, in the process. And, you know, when you think about that order, it means, you know, the, the balance of power in terms of commodities, in terms of technologies, uh, uh, you know, the question of money, um, you know, the, the dollar supremacy, uh, how do you renegotiate the dollar's uh, uh, supremacy? Why does the system work? Why it doesn't work? So these are all big, big generational questions. I mean, the last time we had to deal, uh, think about any of this stuff uh, was, uh, you know, during um, the, the earlier part of the 20th century, the Spanish Civil War, the interwar period. Um, so this is what's complicating things. And, and, and of course, you know, if you just want to stick to macroeconomic variables, you know, inflation is obviously the big uh, uh, bogeyman, so to speak, because inflation hasn't really been a big issue since the 1980s. Uh, uh, Chairman Paul Volcker has successfully slayed inflation for uh, many generations uh, to come. But, you know, when great power conflict rears its ugly head, uh, inflation is always something that we suffer as a result. Um, and so and so here we are. You know, this is not this is not your parents or your grandparents macro. Hmm. I've heard that a lot. And you're right. Geopolitics seems to matter more and more. All, all the topics I want to touch upon, by the way, that you just mentioned, inflation, uh, potentially an economic war, currency war, past dollar world and all this, all these things. But I've been wondering, out of the two most discussed things right now, I guess, would be the liquidity conditions and the state of the economy. Which one of those two do you think matters most right now, or do they matter equally? Um, I think they always matter equally. I mean, you know, the real and the financial world are right on top of each other. Um, you know, you just if you want to think about it in simple uh, simple terms, you know, there, there are supply chains and then on the back of it, there are payment chains. Um, um, look, I think, uh, I think this, the, the, the supply chain of things, uh, the supply chain part of things has been um, uh, under strain, so to speak, uh, uh, ever since 2019. I mean, if you remember, you know, we started with a trade war under President Trump, um, and then then we had a pandemic. Uh, then we had lockdowns, supply chain disruptions, a massive fiscal and monetary response uh, uh, to that pandemic. So we basically stimulated demand 
way above where the level of uh, supply was. Um, you know, uh, co commodity markets are today, I think we could practically say in, in, in disarray. Uh, I mean, there is a big uh, basis that crept in between, you know, commodities that are kind of homogenous. If you think about the fact that you have uh, oil that's flowing east priced in dollars and then there's oil flowing um, oil flowing west priced in dollars and oil flowing east priced in uh, currencies like renminbi or uh, dirhams or or gold even um, uh, you know we can talk later about uh, uh, the deal that ghana has made with uh, with russia in terms of paying for for oil with gold you know these are these are not not usual circumstances and so uh, liquidity, I would say, is is cracking. And when you ask about, you know, the state of liquidity, uh, liquidity is a big thing. Like the world economy is a big thing. So, so I think I think we need to distinguish there between liquidity in the treasury market, which is uh, not great. Uh, uh, I think we can we can understand that from 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 various angles. Just the fact that. Um, you know, the, the size of the market is very big, but the, the dealer's ability to move treasury securities around is just not what it used to be. Uh, we can also look at the fact that uh, uh, foreign central banks have stopped buying treasury securities. And I think that's more so the case since the out, outbreak of the war in the Ukraine. Um, you know, the liquidity is fine in money markets simply because there is so much money in the system. But but I think it's a, it's a situation where that liquidity is basically causing uh, inflation problems on the other side. So, so it's a very complex picture. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but to, to perhaps uh, 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 summarize it, 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 it used to be a Swiss clock that's mostly on time, and now you have all sorts of mechanical issues, uh, both in the real world and in the financial world. And I think we are living through the consequences, and we are managing the consequences. Mm -hmm. The way I think a, a big wake up point for me was one of your pieces where I read that um, the only reason why we could afford all that, all that, I guess, quote unquote, money printing is what people call it over the last decade was because of the deflationary pressures that we've been having. And that's now gone, you say, because of this bifurcation of the market. That's right. Right. Precisely, precisely. Um, you know, the, the, the QE as a policy of printing money started in, in, in 2008. And if you think about the world back then, it was still the case that we had, you know, cheap capital, cheap commodities, cheap labor, uh, supply chains that worked well. Uh, great power conflict was at bay. And, you know, it's, it's precisely these things that have changed. So if you, if you think about it, you know, it's one thing to, to print money, ultimately the goal of which was to try to inflate asset prices, to get house prices up and stock prices up in the, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis in 2008. It's one thing to do that when the real world is dealing with a problem of plenty. You know, when the real world is going to start dealing with a, with a, with a problem of shortages, Printing money is um, is not optimal uh, to 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 uh, to to put it mildly, and, and you know when when you look at the uh, the post um, uh, 2020 world, uh, you know the the issues that you see is that number one, capital is no longer cheap, uh, uh, commodities are no longer plentiful, uh, supply chains are no longer functioning uh, uh, properly. And most importantly, which which is which is the crux of the matter for most economies domestically, you know, the labor markets are not what they used to be simply because the pandemic has changed um, uh, the, the the contours of the labor market. Um, I don't know if you want to talk uh, more in detail about the labor market, but I think if you just think about the fact that uh, you know a lot of the baby boomers that were still hanging on as participants in um, in the labor market before the pandemic, they uh, they uh, retired in large numbers after the pandemic, um, and so you know you you basically have this kind of pre-pandemic postponed retirement of baby boomers just kind of come back with a vengeance uh, during during the pandemic, and we are you know suffering the consequences um, uh, the consequences of that, and, and and of course you know the stimulus measures have also changed. Uh, uh, labor force participation rates um, on the margin. And so today, 
uh, we are stuck basically with a shortage of virtually everything um, that uh, that determines inflation in Western societies. Mm-hmm. It's I don't know if you saw that this this morning, by the way, but the PCE report came in much ho- hotter than expected. It was reported at 1.8 percent. Um, so so much higher than what we saw last time, much higher than what people were expected. And I was reminded of this. It was a great point that Lynn Alden, she's a macro analyst that she she made in her more recent, uh, most recent newsletter. She was saying that the current monetary policy um, towards inflation is sort of like holding a, a beach ball underwater. You know, it's ready to pop back up once the holder lets go. Yeah. And so, well, look, yeah. What does that look, mean? I, I, Yes, the, you know the, there is a there is a there is a I forget who said it, but but you know th- there's a saying in markets which is that you know inflation expectations are well anchored when nobody talks about inflation. Okay, so it, at a time when you cannot really see clients without talking about inflation, or 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 you can't you know record this discussion without talking about inflation, it means that something is up. I mean, if you just want to take a very objective view, inflation has been an issue for the past three years. Okay, um, it's starting to impact um, inflation expectations. When you peel the inflation onion, you know everybody understands that there is basically three parts to it. There is headline inflation, which is basically food and energy. There is goods, which is very volatile. Some items are up, some items are down. Some some are you know inflating a lot. Some are outright deflating. And then there is the services part, which is largely a function of um, of labor costs. And you know, let let's just start with the labor costs. The labor labor cost component is troubling because the labor market is not falling off the cliff. You know, unemployment is at a record low um, everywhere, practically. Um, wage growth is holding up very well, around four four or five percent. So that basically tells you that core services inflation. Um, stuff that determines the price of services, uh, you know, wages, the things that determine the, the, the pace of services inflation is trending around four or 5%. So that's way above the Fed's targets, okay? Then, you know, goods up and down, let's just forget about goods. The important thing on top of a tight labor market and, and firm wage dynamics is the fact that food and energy are basically stochastic variables. Okay. Everybody understands that energy is going to be something that's uh, potentially going to get caught up in uh, geopolitics because energy is always very geopolitical, especially when the world um, is uh, is going through transformative change. Um, energy markets alongside other commodity markets are are extremely tight because basically just finished a decade of no investments in, um, in, uh, in, in oil and gas fields. So we can revisit this topic. And then food is, 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 a, is, is, a, is a derivative of energy because you know, we are basically living in an age of, of industrial agriculture where you need um, y- you know, uh, energy to grow things, you need energy to transport things, you need uh, 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 fertilizers. Um, uh, and, so, and so all of these things are basically uh, pressuring inflation. And if you want to be very objective, and I think the Fed is very good at not overthinking things, and, they, and I think they are quite uh, objective about understanding the situation. When you have a situation like what we have today, where food and energy price inflation is stochastic and the risks are more to the upside than to the downside, and you have a historically super tight labor market, you know, those are the only things that matter for inflation and for inflation expectations. You know, the way I like to put it, you know, people don't go on a strike and you don't ask for higher wages when the price of flat screen TVs goes up. You know, you are going to to ask for all that when uh, when the price of food, fuel and shelter are up. But that's basically the uh, uh, that, that's that's the basic setup. And, and so, you know, it's it's um, it's it's a struggle for the Fed because a lot of these things are out of their control. And, you know, they have done a lot. I mean, they have raised interest rates from zero to 5%. And we don't really have much progress to show for it. I mean, you know, the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy have slowed, housing has slowed tremendously. But in terms of the indicators, you would have hoped to have responded by now. Inflation coming down more, unemployment going up more, wage, wage pressure slowing down more. 
we don't really have any of the results yet. Mm. So that means that the Fed will have to keep pushing that beach ball underwater. Exactly. So that, that means that, that the Fed is going to have to deal with these pressures. Um, I think, uh, you know, for, for the, look, for the, for, the, for the time being, you have to think about the Fed as, as an institution that has floored the terminal rate, so to speak. Um, you know, the, 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 the rate at which they are going to leave policy rates at the peak of the hiking cycle. They floored the terminal rate at 5% for the time being. And Chair Powell was very clear about the way forward. The way forward is very simple. It depends on the pace of economic momentum and it depends on the pace of inflation. Um, if the economic momentum doesn't slow and if there are upside surprises to inflation um, and if you know oil, for example, goes to 150, you, know, you should have no doubts that the Fed is going to respond to that by hiking interest rates higher and keeping rates higher for much longer than what the market anticipates. Mm. So it is higher for longer. Uh, are they focused on that, though, or are they focused on like, because there's talks about currency war, the dollar being weaponized and stuff like that. Well, look, I mean, I think I think um, those are those are, you know, separate considerations. I mean, for the U.S., it's always been the case that, you know, it's our currency, your problem, you know, um, uh, uh, th there is always collateral damage when we hike interest rates. You know, uh, it's the dollar gets stronger. It's more expensive to buy commodities. It's more expensive to service debt. Uh, exchange rates get pushed around. But ultimately, you know that you know even you know the, the Fed has a dual mandate. It doesn't have a triple mandate. The, du the dual mandate is uh, stable prices and full employment. The triple mandate perhaps would be global financial stability or something like that. Mm. Global financial stability is something that either happens or it doesn't. But, you know, just to give you a sense, even the dual mandate right now is just a singular mandate. You know, the full employment mandate is not something that the Fed is targeting right now because we are beyond full employment. So the only thing that they are focused now, now on is to get inflation down to 2% as soon as possible. And we needed to be there yesterday. And we're mm. still far above it today huh so they're not really focusing on on the world de-dollarizing and trying to fight that no because again it's you know it's the, the, as i like to say you know fine well not just finance but life i guess is hierarchical too you know so you have your list of items you focus on and there's a pecking order so the most important thing is restoring confidence in a dollar as a store of value, which means inflation has to be down at 2% and real interest rates have to be positive. Hmm. It's very important, right? I mean, if you think about what Paul Volcker did, for example, I mean, he did it in a very dramatic fashion, but that's precisely what he has done. You know, he raised interest rates sharply to slay inflation and to bring real interest rates positive such that uh, there is confidence in a dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, we are doing some version of that. I mean, obviously, we, we have a, a, an economy that's far more financialized. So you can't go from zero to 20 in, um, in one shot, which is, this is essentially what Paul Volcker did. I don't think that we will have to go to 20. But, you know, we, you obviously want to do it a bit more carefully because you don't want to damage the financial system in the process. Uh, but again, we've traveled a long way, but it doesn't mean that just because we've had all this pain in stocks and bonds last year, the Fed is not going to keep on pushing rates higher if it, um, if it has to. If and it I would also say one more thing, which is that, you know, th th there, is this, there is this debate in financial markets about, you know, is, is Jay Powell Volcker or not? You know, does he, does he have what it takes? And I think we should not overthink that. I mean, you know, as, as a public servant, uh, you know, Jay Powell knows exactly uh, what he is going to be remembered for in history. And, you know, the, the single most important thing you need to keep in mind about the current Fed chair is that he started this hiking cycle by saying that Paul Volcker is my hero. OK, so once you start your inflation fight with that manifesto, so to speak, that basically means that you are trying to defend the legacy of a man who has given the world the concept of central bank credibility. The reason why central banks have a credibility today is because of Paul Volcker's achievements. So once you say 
that's the standard I'm trying to live up to. If you do not deliver 110% of that, you know you will have damaged central bank reputation for a generation. You know, so this is a central bank chair that, you know, has a mandate from the White House, uh, uh, which, you know, President Biden said that, you know, inflation is public enemy number one. You know, the Fed is going to slay inflation. And so, you know, when, when the political and technocratic parts of inflation fighting are aligned, they are aligned. So, you know, make, 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 make no mistake about this. You know, the, the Fed is going to do a tough job. It's just, you know, they are taking a bit longer than, uh, than, than Volcker did. But again, that's because you just have a far more financialized economy and, and you have to treat it with a bit of a patience. But we are making progress. Mm. But if it's not 20%, you said higher for longer, what would you guess it would be? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it just very simply, if you look at what the Fed and other central banks have done in inflationary periods in the, fast, in the past, what you always do is you raise interest rates to a level where interest rates are above the rate of inflation in a spot sense. So if inflation is 6% today, interest rates would be at 7% because then you have real interest rates today so you're slowing economic momentum today. You know, what we have been doing is we've been raising interest rates, but in a spot sense, real interest rates are still negative. You know, you know, Fed funds is, I don't know, four and a half, five percent, but inflation is above it. OK, so real rates are positive in a forward sense. So assuming inflation slows as expected and assuming we are going to keep interest rates high for X period of time, ultimately, we are going to get to you know, positive real rates. And so we are kind of hoping for that. And so we are, we, are, we are in this game of trying not to do too much and not to cause too much damage, not, 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 not to do unnecessary pain uh, to get things done. But I guess if that strategy doesn't work, um, uh, you, know that, you know what the more drastic measures are going to mean. You're just going to have to keep raising rates until real interest rates are above the rate of inflation.